This series will be on the Duchy of Corland and Semigalia, a story you've probably never heard about, and if you have, you've most likely heard very little. This video will be on the events that preceded the founding of this duchy, and the reign of the duchy's first duke. Let's get into it, shall we? First, let's set the scene. Russia under Ivan the Terrible had created an impressive military and had expanded quite a bit. His eyes were soon set on Livonia for multiple reasons. The Teutonic Order had recently become a vassal duchy of Poland, the Duchy of Prussia. Not all remnants of the Teutonic Order were lost though. The semi-autonomous branch in Livonia, known as the Livonian Order, was still there, but it was decaying. Not only was it a part of the endlessly confusing and changing Livonian Confederation, but it was also falling prey to religious division, since the Protestant Reformation had reached Livonia. Although the Holy Roman Empire had supported their German brethren in Livonia for quite a long time, a shift in priorities and general apathy stopped the aid from coming in. Now with the stage set, the play can begin. The year was 1556. The current master of the Livonian order, Heinrich von Galen, was preparing for war. The Archbishop of Riga, Wilhelm von Brandenburg, chose Christopher of Mecklenburg as his coadjutor the year before without even consulting the Livonian order. This, as well as the fact that he was the brother of Albrecht, the first Duke of Prussia, and the cousin of the Polish king and Grand Duke of Lithuania, Sigismund II, had led most of the order to believe that Wilhelm, Albrecht, and Sigismund were planning on taking the order's territory. Galen decided to prepare for war so that he didn't get caught off guard, and so that maybe he could make a preemptive strike. He sent out the commander of Duneburg to the Holy Roman Empire so that he could hire some mercenaries. This commander's name was Goddard Kettler. On his journey to the Holy Roman Empire, Goddard would see the huge and fearsome comet, in shape not unlike a broom, and it was as though it pointed a finger at the disaster which was subsequently to befall Livonia. The suspicions and paranoia in the Livonian order got worse and worse, and as this fear was boiling over, possible letters from the Archbishop of Riga to Prussia were intercepted and decoded. These letters supposedly showed proof of a conspiracy, and that was it. In preparation to what was coming, there was an election for Galen's coadjutor. Jasper von Munster represented the Protestants, while Wilhelm von Furstenberg represented the Catholics. Furstenberg won the election. Galen ordered Werner Schall von Bell to bring some men and wait near Kokenhausen, where Wilhelm von Brandenburg and Christopher resided at the time. Werner's goal was to intercept any message to or from the Archbishop. A delegate from Sigismund tried to sneak their way to Kokenhausen, but he was caught by Werner's men. He was beaten by them so badly that he died a few days later. Soon after, every bishopric in Livonia and the Livonian order declared war on the archbishop. The most important target was Kokenhausen. Furstenberg arrived on June 28th, and only two days later, both Brandenburg and Christopher gave themselves up. What followed was diplomatic chaos. Delegates and letters were sent from every player on the Baltic, and it took Sigismund marching a giant army into Livonia for an agreement to be made. In 1557, everybody met under Sigismund's tent in Posval. The archbishop and his coadjutor would be allowed to resume their positions, an alliance was made, though it didn't actually do much in terms of promised action from Sigismund, though it made Ivan pretty nervous. Speaking of Ivan, the Livonian Order was also not allowed to renew its truce with Russia. I should probably let you know that Galen is no longer the master of the Order since he retired and died a few weeks later, so currently Furstenberg is the master of the Livonian Order. Russia had responded to the new agreements made between Sigismund and the Livonian Order by sending raiders across into Dorpat. It's unlikely that Ivan was ready to invade, but after hearing about Livonia's pathetically weak response, he realized that the conquest of Livonia wouldn't be as difficult as he first assumed. And so he prepared for a proper invasion. Goddard finally came back to Livonia and came to the city of Narva. He camped near the city, but not in the city itself. A few days after setting up camp, Narva lit up. The fire was so big that Goddard and his forces 20 miles away could see it. Goddard and his men rode to Narva as soon as they saw it. 
The city was huge and they weren't familiar with the layout. They spent some time looking for a guide, but they couldn't find one and since Goddard didn't want to risk being ambushed, he just went back to camp. A few hours later, some refugees from the city arrived. Narva had fallen, and Goddard couldn't do a thing. The funny thing is that the Russians probably didn't set the fire. It was probably just a house fire that went out of control and the Russians took advantage of the situation. Now the Russians had a stronghold across the Narva River, giving them a good point to continue their invasion. Not only that, but they had access to the city's leftover artillery and weaponry, and access to western merchants who were very willing to trade with the Russians. The next target Russia had was the city of Dorpat a city that was also very close to the Russian border. After a short siege, everyone in the city knew that things were hopeless. Not only were they suffering from Russian artillery, but also Russian sympathizers setting fires and working with Ivan, who had come to the siege of Dorpat personally. The city was eventually taken. The Livonian Order swiftly lost control of the situation. There was barely any organization, everyone blamed everyone for the predicament they were in, and most of the commanders were doing terribly. Not Kettler, though. Kettler had proven himself to be one of the only competent commanders by taking the castle of Ringen. Soon after this victory, Russia made a six-month truce with the Livonians so that they could deal with Crimeans. And unexpectedly, Kettler was absolutely livid. You see, he had just hired a bunch of mercenaries in preparation for an assault, and since the order lacked soldiers, he couldn't just let them go back or stop paying them because if the Russians attacked, they were needed. So what happens when a bunch of mercenaries are spread across a region that's actively falling apart and are paid to do nothing? Bad things. Bad things happen. Although the truce did give Goddard, who pretty much became the de facto master of the Livonian order, the time he needed to work on diplomacy. A delegation went to Sweden, and a delegation including Goddard went to Lithuania. The trip to Sweden went well at first, but then there was a hiccup. One of the men in the delegation, when addressing the King Gustav, said his most illustrious majesty instead of his most sincere majesty. Negotiations went nowhere. The delegation apparently got to see some reindeer though, so it's not all bad. I'm not kidding about that, by the way. So how did the other delegation fare? Well, actually pretty well. In Vilnius, a defensive alliance treaty was signed, basically saying that Sigismund could get some castles in exchange for money that he would give military aid against Russia, and that once peace is made under certain conditions, the Livonian Order would have those castles back, in exchange for the money that they gave. This agreement was sent to the HRE, whose emperor promised to finally aid Livonia once more. Once Goddard came back, he became the de jure master of the order, while Furstenberg was sent to defend the central city of Felin. Even with this new defensive alliance, the problems that the order was having didn't just go away. Many soldiers and mercenaries just stopped following orders since they weren't receiving enough pay anymore. The countryside was ravaged by Russian raiders and unpaid mercenaries making up for their lack of pay, while the economic aid they were expecting from the Holy Roman Empire was nowhere to be found. Also, they were running out of horses, and in a 16th century war, that's very bad. Kettler tried to take a fort near Narva, but a few days in, most of the peasants and mercenaries just straight up left most of them not even waiting to get their pay, and so it was forced to turn back. The city of Felin fell to the Russians after mercenaries had given up the old master Furstenberg, who would be imprisoned in Russia never to be seen again. Then the king of Denmark's brother bought two bishoprics and planned on taking Livonia for himself under Russia, and Raval pledged allegiance to Sweden because they were sick of having to deal with Kettler's lack of anything and footing the bill for a lot of the war. It's easy to see why Kettler thought that submission to a greater power was the only way for the order to survive in any sort of capacity. The existence of Prussia showed Kettler that he could probably get a vassal duchy if he opted for submission to Sigismund II. So he did. Negotiations in Vilnius in 1561 would lead to a treaty that includes this. We will bestow upon the illustrious Lord Master of Livonia the ducal title, like that of the illustrious Lord Duke in Prussia, together with all dignity, insignia, and ducal privileges. Most of Livonia would become part of Lithuania. The former bishopric of Courland would be given to Lithuania a few years later, and the city of Riga a few years after that. The Livonian Order's territory left of the Dogova River became the Duchy of Courland and Semigalia. The Pacta Subiectionis, also known as the Provisio Ducalis, and a little later the Privilegium Sigismundi, 
were pretty much the constitution of the new duchy. It included the freedom to practice Lutheranism, the continuation of the nobles' privileges they had before the establishment of the duchy, and the right of Germans to hold official posts. The documents also established that the Duke of this duchy is equal to the Duke of Prussia in status, and that the title is hereditary and can only be given to males. Now starts the reign of the first Duke of the Duchy of Courland and some- I'm, I'm just gonna say Courland. I don't care if it's technically incorrect, the correct term is a mouthful. Where was I? Alright, first Duke. Goddard stopped getting involved in the war directly, though he did give military and material aid to Poland and Lithuania for their efforts in the war. Just because Goddard stopped getting involved in the war doesn't mean he could just lie back and relax. Seeing as he became the ruler of a newly created vassal duchy, he had to gain the support of his nobles. Many already accepted him, since this situation was better than being part of a polity that was actively falling apart, but not everyone accepted him. The best example of that would be Matthias von der Rieck. Matthias refused to accept Goddard for a reason I couldn't find, so take your pick. Matthias was the commander of Doblin, and after Corland was created he gave himself the title of Lord and Heir to Doblin. Goddard tried to negotiate with him, but he wouldn't budge. Although Goddard wasn't done with him yet, he had other things to tend to. One of the reasons that many nobles didn't like Goddard was that he wasn't part of a royal family. He was just a noble statesman that became the duke because he was in charge at the right time. To make it harder for nobles to make that argument, he married a princess, Anna of Mecklenburg, in 1566. Anyway, now that he had his royaltiness boosted, it was time to take care of Matthias. A few months after he got married, Goddard captured Matthias as he was beginning his journey to the Holy Roman Empire. He took away most of Matthias' land in exchange for his release, but this wasn't the end. Matthias would go to Lithuania and argue in the courts for the rights to his lands back. This issue would go on until 1576. In 1569, Poland and Lithuania officially united. I mention this because Courland was no longer a vassal duchy of Lithuania, but a vassal duchy of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. In 1570, Goddard created the Privilegium Gotardinum, a new constitution which had a lot more rules. Throughout his reign, Goddard also showed his commitment to Lutheranism. He had dozens of churches built or restored, had all the important Lutheran books translated to Latvian so that the native peasants, many of whom were actually still pagan, could read up on God and stuff. Look, religion isn't my strong suit, okay? Also, Goddard's wife, whom I'll just call Duchess Anna, helped Goddard a lot. As a princess, she was pretty familiar with estate management and other noble European duties. She even received envoys and local nobles for informal meetings about official business. Although all this may sound fine and dandy, this all had to do with nobility. The nobles didn't really care about the local proto-Latvians. They made up most of the laborers, but the nobles had no incentive to actually help those people out. Many of them became serfs because they were either refugees that didn't have any other option, or they were locals that were under the control of the nobles that had lost much of their wealth during the war. Courts could also condemn free people to become serfs, and there was no way to appeal for that. Most of them were not allowed to leave their land, hunt, brew alcohol, or even sell their surpluses. I say most because the rules on taxation and regulation on non-noble activity varied depending on where you lived and which lord you served under. For an example of good treatment, the Kettler family is perfect. Goddard would actually treat the peasants that lived on their lands much better than most of the other nobles. Peasants were allowed to have military and clerical careers and taxation was never raised out of nowhere for no reason. This might not sound like much to us today, but for the 16th century this is pretty good. The coat of arms of the duchy was finally accepted by the new king of Poland-Lithuania, Stephen Batry, in 1579. It took a long time because of the Livonian War and the almost civil war that preceded Batry's ascension. The lion represents Coraland, the elk symbolizes Semigalia, the shield in the center has a pot hook that comes from the Kettler coat of arms, and the SA stands for Sigismund II Augustus. Goddard and Anna had three children that would live to adulthood. Anna. Wilhelm, and Friedrich. And that's mostly it. By 1580, Goddard Kettler was over 60 years old. Thankfully, Goddard had the Duke's court and a diet that was represented by the nobles, so the duchy didn't fall into chaos as he became more senile, but he also couldn't just retire. His children were still young after all, none of them could take the mantle yet. Sadly, death doesn't wait for when it's most convenient to strike. In 1582, the Livonian War finally ended, 
and in 1587, Goddard Kettler shut his eyes for the final time. Goddard Kettler's body was put in the Mittau Palace Vault, the vault that would also house the corpses of his successors. I'm pretty sure you can visit that vault nowadays. I'll leave a link for that in the description. Will Goddard's successors be able to turn this fledgling little duchy into anything more than it was? Well, we'll just have to wait and see, won't we? Thanks for watching, and see you next time in part two.